would highly recommend to people studying the book of Acts. Would you say that? I definitely would say that too. So if you don't have your Bible open yet, we'll go ahead and open to Acts 28 and begin with a word of prayer. I do have one more question. How many of you have found that sometimes whatever you're studying in the scripture happens to you personally with challenges or whatever it might be? Well, none of you have been shipwrecked I'm glad, <laughs> since last week, but a lot of times we can think, oh, but it seems like I'm just having that same thing happening to me. And sometimes we can. I have a funny thing to tell you uh, when we began our study about uh, something that happened to me this week that applies very much to Acts 28. You ladies, come on in. And while you are, some of you may not know my husband. I've introduced you to my sister and the interpreters. But my husband, Keith, would you stand up or come up here or something? This is my husband, Keith Williams. And you've heard me re refer to him. I think most of y'all know Keith, don't you? Yeah, probably most of you know him. Thank you for being here, honey. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we celebrate, celebrate you. We are so excited, Lord, that in your grand mercy, you not only save us, but then you give us your Holy Spirit. And on top of that, you record how Christianity, Father, began after Jesus arose and the fulfillment of the Holy Spirit coming. And we have seen the Holy Spirit and you, Jesus, working through Paul and Peter and these others. Lord, continue in this final session to teach us. And I pray, Father, you would just help your teaching today go so deeply into our hearts and our minds that this day, this teaching, Acts 28, will be one that we will carry in our hearts and our minds and in our actions from now on, that we'll be changed women. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, Acts 28, but I wanted to tell you, as we look at this, I wish we could kind of go back and read part of Acts 27, because we've looked at this terrible shipwreck that Paul has had after he advised people not to go ahead and sail because it was the wrong time of the year. Oh, and I lost my PowerPoint here, and let me get it turned back on for you. There you go. And, and so we're looking at this and how Paul just keeps forging ahead, and he keeps forging ahead and everything that he's gone through. And of course, in Acts 27, they struck a reef. Uh, they had to swim in the cold, icy water. The, this tornado-like wind was howling about them. They have undergone 14 days of no eating prior to that. And now they finally get to this island. And let's begin reading in Acts 28. When they had been brought safely through, then we found out that the island was called Malta. And the natives showed us extraordinary kindness. For because of the rain that had set in, because of the cold, so you can just see them wet, shivering, uh, probably emaciated, thirsty, hungry, just we can't even imagine their physical condition at this point. It says, so when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened itself on his hand. Now, friends, can you just imagine all of a sudden you've got this, you've got this viper on your hand and you're just like, ah! <laughs> I mean, at this point, if I was Paul, I would just be like, oh, enough is enough. You know, shipwreck, stoning, prison. Lord, enough is enough. Have you ever felt like that? Lord, enough is enough. I can't take one more thing. Only to have this viper stuck on your hand. The reason I said I had an experience that, not like Paul's, but this last, I guess it was Thursday or Friday, I was in the garage sweeping. I do do something besides study. Uh, and I was sweeping my neglected garage. And all of a sudden, I see a snake, a viper. I mean, just a few feet from me. I handled it very calmly. <laughs> it ran in the house for Keith. Keith, a snake, a snake, a snake, a snake. And so when I opened this up and I, I read, you know, that here he's dealing with this viper that's fastened itself on his hand, I just thought, oh, I, 
I think at that point I would have had a heart attack. We wouldn't have had to have worried about the venom killing me because I just would have had an absolute heart attack. But truly, it, there are times that we can just think, and, oh, one more thing, one more thing. I thought today might be better. But so far, it hasn't been for Paul. It says, when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they began to say to one another, undoubtedly, this man is a murderer. And though he has been saved from the sea, justice what has not allowed him to live. Here we go again. There's a snake. Then there are these people being critical. Critical spirit. Has that ever bugged you? That people are just jumping to conclusions about something about you? And so now Paul's got this going on. And so, however, verse 5, when he shook the creature off into the fire and suffered no harm, verse 6, but they were expecting that he was about to swell up or suddenly fall down. Did you hear all of those S's, Paul? Are you kind of adjusting this? Are y'all hearing a lot of S's? Yeah, I think we're hearing a lot of S's, and thank you, Paul, for, for trying to work on that. It said that they were expecting that he was about to swell up or suddenly fall that dead. But after they had waited a long time and had seen nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and began to say that he was a god. Now, friends, I can just see Paul just sitting there by the fire, and everybody's just, just any minute now, just any minute now, he's going to go down. Just any minute now, he's going to swell up. I'm just watching to see you swell up. <laughs> do you ever feel like people are just watching you, just watching to see if you do something wrong? I have a, a good word. The Lord has a good word for us in here. You just keep being a Christian, committed to your convictions, because there are people watching you. And after a while, they're going to see, just like they watched Paul and they saw, they're going to see that your faith is real, that you are a good person, that you haven't done something wrong deserving of what you've gone through. So you hang in there. In verse 7, now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the leading men of the men of the island named Publis, who was who had welcomed us and entertained us courteously for three days. And it happened that after the father of Publis was lying in bed, afflicted with recurrent fever and dysentery, and Paul went in to see him. And after he had prayed, he laid his hands on him and healed him. And after this had happened, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases were coming to him and getting cured, and they also honored us with many marks of respect, and when we were setting sail, they supplied us with all we needed. Now, that's a good, that's a good word, isn't it? Let's take, take home some of these points, and perhaps you can think, not, not of Paul's situation, but your situation, shipwreck, swims ashore in the rain and the cold, serves others, gathers firewood, Snake fastens to the hand, says he's a murderer, got it coming to him. But Paul was more than a conqueror, wasn't he? He conquered through the power of the Holy Spirit who was in him. And this is the good news for you and me. We don't have to fall. We don't have to fail, although we may at times and will at times. But you and I can be more than conquerors. First of all, our first point is understand that we live in a poisoned world where bad things happen to godly people. Don't you agree? Our world is poisoned ever since a serpent came into that garden and Adam and Eve took hold of the sin that was being offered them. Our, our, sin na our nature, our human nature that God created us to be in his likeness became poisoned. And so we are going to experience the venom side effects of living in a poisoned world. But you know what we can do? You and I can shake it off. We can shake off people's critical spirits of our faith. We can shake it off when we hear lies. We can shake it off when the devil starts to appeal to our self-pity. Oh, you poor thing. You're going through so much. Oh, why does it have to happen to you again? I never see self-pity in Paul. Do you? I never, I never see self-pity. I never see, <clears throat> excuse me, 
I never see Luke recording any of that. And we see how Paul managed. He literally had something very bad happening to him, and he shook it off. There may be times that you just need, I need to say, you know what, that was a bad disagreement we had. You know what, that was a bad financial decision. I'm going to learn from it. I'm go oh, I'm going to pay attention to it and learn from it. I'm going to be careful when I pick up some wood and watch to see if there's a snake. I'm going to be real careful every time now I go out in the garage. I do. I open the door and I'm like... <laughs> so our past affects our future, doesn't it? And that, that can be helpful. But then we don't just stay stuck in it. We understand. To be more than a conqueror, we see that it's important to serve rather than simply sit waiting to be served. Paul was gathering wood. I mean, he has, he has done so much. He's been the one to lead out and say, it's time to eat. I'm leading us in prayer. I'm breaking the bread. I'm distributing it. It's important for you and me. Anytime that the Lord gives us an opportunity to work, to serve, that we don't sit back and think, I'm going to let those other people. I'm tired. We, more than conquer, serve, rather than sit, waiting to be served, and they work rather than whine. Shake off any whining, ladies. Three, shake off the serpent's poisonous lies that God doesn't see or care about us. As I mentioned, we may ask, or more than conquer, may ask, why me? What's going on, Lord? But then they seize the situation to glorify God. And this is what Paul did. He sat there and he said, okay, you can just sit here and stare at me. I'm not swelling up. I'm not dying. I'm on this island because of God, and I'm going to look for how I can serve God's purposes. And so Paul doesn't take a vacation on that island. Paul starts healing people. And no doubt when Jesus healed people, when the woman came up and touched the hem of his robe, he said, who touched me? And then he explained, I felt the power go out. That is such an incredible passage if you haven't studied it in a while. But, but Jesus said, I felt the power go out of me. And friends, when you are serving the Lord, when you are counseling, when you are working with people, when you are ministering, when you're taking care of that family, when you're praying, you're going to experience feeling sometimes tired and the power going out of you. That's why it's so important that we are constantly being replenished, refilled. That's why Ephesians 5.18 says, be filled. It's the imperfect tense. It means continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit never runs out. And so we are to continually be filled. We want to seize any opportunity God places in our hands before us to serve the Lord and glorify him. More than conquerors, thank God, more than couragers, conquerors, I'm sorry, <clears throat> take courage. As we continue reading in Acts 38, beginning with verse 11, it says, at the end of three months, we set sail on an Alexandrian ship which had wintered at the island and which had the twin brothers for its figurehead. Why in the world would Luke mention that? Because he is telling us that this is a ship that's been dedicated to the Roman gods. So here they are on a ship dedicated to the Roman gods, the sons of Jupiter, and it never ends. Wherever we are in this life, we're going to have the God of this world that we're living in, walking through our days. And, and as much as we can't wait for heaven where no other God will be there except the Lord our God who is holy and pure and all the things that we can't wait to experience in his presence in this world, we will be on the ship of this earth where other gods are worshipped. But what's so beautiful about this is the presence of God, the true God in Luke and Paul was on that ship. And they're ministering, and they're serving. 
and they put in at Syracuse, stayed there for three days. Verse 13, from there we sailed around and arrived at Regum. And a day later, a south wind sprang up. And on the second day, we came to Puteoli. There we found some brethren and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And thus we, oh, read it with me. And thus we came to Rome. <laughs> we're here, we're here, we're here, we're here, we're here. And even though Paul knew that Rome <clears throat> was probably going to end up being his last place, still just the, I'm here, I'm here. Because Jesus had told him, the Holy Spirit had told him, you must go to Rome. You must stand before Caesar. And so here he is. And he was so excited because Verse 15, the brethren, when they heard about us, they came from there as far as the market of Epius and three ends to meet us. And when Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. Would you just do that with me? Took courage. You know, sometimes we don't have courage. We don't have it. We don't have it. But do you remember so many times Jesus stood beside Paul and said, take courage. Well, where do we get that courage? Where do we reach for it? Who gives it? Well, sometimes you may be the face of someone who helps another person take courage because you're there and you're saying, I'm praying for you. And that may be where somebody gets to take the courage. But most often where we take courage is by reading the scriptures. Most often, the place that we get the courage, the source of the courage, is when we're just on our knees or we're praying or we're looking up at the heavens and talking to God. And he says, I'm here for you. And we take the courage that he gives us. We are going to be needing that courage more and more and more, friends, as the time of Christ appearing nears. A fifth thing that we see that is characteristic of those who are more than conquerors. They know the scripture, they speak the scripture, and they welcome all who will come and hear the scripture. In verses 17 through 30, we read, After three days Paul called together those who were the leading men of the Jews, and when they came together, he began saying to them, Brethren, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And when they examined me, they were willing to release me, because there was no ground for putting me to death. But when the Jews objected, I was forced to appeal to Caesar, not that I had any accusations against my nation. He goes on speaking. You've read this passage. You've discussed it in your group. We see that in verse 24, some of the Jews were receiving what he was saying. Some of them were not being persuaded. But Paul knew the scriptures. He quoted Isaiah. And I want you to look in verse 25. When they did not agree with one another, they began leaving after Paul had spoken one parting word. The Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to your fathers. Did you pause when you read that? The Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah. Isaiah was a man. And even before Christ's ascension and him sending the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gave Isaiah, he gave the Old Testament prophets the words to write in this book. Anything you are reading, this is a Holy Spirit-inspired word of God. And the Holy Spirit is still speaking, and he's speaking through you. When you're filled with his Spirit, and you're teaching his word, you're giving encouragement. You're sending somebody a Bible verse. The Holy Spirit is operating in a powerful way through you. Hallelujah. More than conquerors. Know the scripture. Speak the scripture. And welcome all who will listen. More than conquerors. Six. Keep preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the word of Jesus Christ. Even if some are not persuaded. More than conquerors are convinced that nothing can separate them from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. More than conquerors are convinced. 
convinced nothing can separate them from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And so Paul says those words that he knows will not be well received by the Jews in verse 28 at through 31. It said, Paul says, therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will also listen. And when he had spoken these words, the Jews departed, having a great dispute among themselves. And he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God, teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness unhindered. He was house arrest. And that is how the book of Acts ends. And we say, oh my goodness, what happened? Did he stand before Nero? We need the rest of the story. Was he released? Well, we do know that uh, Nero did apparently dismiss his case. He apparently went before Nero. Jesus said that he was going to stand before Caesar. So we know that he did. He then apparently went to Crete with Titus. He left Titus in charge of the church there. He went back on a missionary journey that he didn't expect to make back to Ephesus. And he left Timothy there as the bishop in Ephesus. We don't know if he ever got to Spain. We don't know if he ever got to the British Isles. There are some historians who think that maybe he made that trip. He went back to Rome. He was arrested. He was put in the maritime, horrible, horrible, horrible prison dungeon that was like a cistern. And that is where Paul uh, wrote from there. He wrote 2 Timothy. I want to read 2 Timothy to you, what he wrote from that maritime prison. You're very familiar with these words in 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. It kind of makes me teary. Does it you as you think about all Paul's gone through? I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Paul was marched outside of that maritime prison and historians believe then beheaded. And I, I can't imagine how Paul must have felt when his head was put on that chopping block and he knew in the next second he was going to be in the presence <laughs> of Jesus, whose presence had come and been with him in those dark times. More than conquerors are convinced that nothing can separate them from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. More than conquerors. Would you read aloud with me Romans 8, 31, 32, that I have on the overhead, words that Paul wrote to the Romans. What then? shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against them God has chosen. It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and he is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or the sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Would you read that last verse again? Like you are a warrior woman for the Lord. 
No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Would you stand up and read it again with all your conviction? Because these are our marching orders. We are not to leave here and say, oh, that was a good Bible study of Acts. I learned so much. No, you and I go out as warrior women, fighting, standing for the cause of God, convinced that nothing will separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So this is our words to you, Lord. This is our words to you, world. This is our words to our family. Will you say them with me strongly? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you. The principle that we see is that the Holy Spirit empowers believers to do mo more than simply cope. Friends, there are so many books and psychological programs on how to cope, how to cope, how to, how to cope, seven steps, for co seven steps for coping in times of discouragement. No, this is not a book on how to cope. This is a book on how to conquer, how to conquer our self-pity, how to conquer our sin habits, how to conquer our bad moods, our attitudes, how to conquer fear. It's not a book on how to cope. So you are not my friend, the coper. You are my friend, the conqueror, okay? You are my friend, the conqueror. So as always, we must apply X. Are you? convinced nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Can I hear you? Amen? Amen. Amen. Are you more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus? Yes. Are you a witness, not a whiner, who lives and speaks by the power of the Holy Spirit? I want you to take just a quiet moment we have five minutes left. I'm not going to keep you here five minutes, but I'd like for you to look at your listening guide and prayerfully answer those application questions. What the Lord has taught you through this study of Acts, how the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and what he wants to speak through you as a result of this study.
You know, Paul had a lot of suffering, but I guarantee you that man had a lot of fun with the Lord because you know from your own experience when the Holy Spirit speaks into you something, when, when you overcome something, when Paul shook that viper off of his hand when he went to bed that night, he had to have said, Lord, that was really cool. <laughs> When he was able to heal people, oh, Father, that was so neat. When you are walking by the power of the Holy Spirit, yes, it is hard. Yes, it is work. But I hope you are every day having a set time, as I've told you so often, like I do in my prayer journal, where I'm writing down and I'm concentrating and I'm thinking every, every day, morning or night, morning, is, and I'm writing, Lord, thank you. And we celebrate. And Jesus and I have a good time on what he has done the day before, the day, the current day, whatever it may be. It's a relationship. So make sure as you go through your more than conquering experiences that you are taking the time and making the point of getting together with Jesus and just saying, that was fun. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And I want to say right now as we close, it's been fun being with you for the study of Acts. I've enjoyed it. I thank you for being here. I'm excited that we're going to get to go down and have some fellowship time now. I'm looking forward to being with you uh, again next fall as we study John. But you keep your relationship with Jesus, not just one of mourning and praying and request, request, request. You keep your relationship with Jesus where you're going back and you're saying, yes, you did it. Yes. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can shake off the snakes, that we are not a captive of the devil, that we are more than conquerors in you, Christ Jesus. We are your warrior women. And Lord, we are so proud to be those who are citizens of your kingdom. We are bold, not ashamed. We are glad to be your voice. And Father, I pray your blessings on these ladies now as they go forth more than conquerors, convinced that nothing can separate them from the love that you have through Christ Jesus, that relationship you've given us. Use us, Lord, for your glory. Would you say that with me? Use us, Lord, for your glory. And all the people said, amen. Thank you. I'll see y'all at the gathering. And Pat, we thank you so much for